How can we get a better understanding of the divisions in our society? Welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. This episode is called A House Divided. We're looking for an explanation for our divided country that goes beyond the standard political, social, historical, and economic explanations. We want to look at our polarized society in terms of a social psychological perspective. We're going to play for you a recent conversation we had with Dr. Sheldon Solomon. Sheldon Solomon, Ph.D., is a social psychologist at Skidmore College. He is best known for co-developing terror management theory with Jeff Greenberg and Tom Pazinski, which is concerned with how humans deal with our own sense of mortality. He is author or co-author of over a hundred articles and several books, and has been featured in various films, television documentaries, and radio interviews. He co-authored the book The Worm at the Core on the Role of Death in Life with Greenberg and Pazinski. He most recently appeared in the documentaries Planet of the Humans and Unfit. Here's the conversation with Dr. Solomon. Sheldon, welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. Great to be back. Oh, great. Hi, Sheldon. Hello, Ken. Thank you for being our guest once again. It's a pleasure to have you back on our show. The title of this episode is A House Divided. We're looking for an explanation for our divided country that goes beyond the standard political, social, historical, and economic explanations. We want to look at our polarized society in terms of a social psychological perspective, okay? So, could we start with just a little bit about terror management theory and the whole theory of mortality salience, and then move from there into the whole death thought accessibility theory? But if you'd start with the, the basics. Yeah, certainly. And... Uh... A good idea, by the way, even for folks that are familiar with this work, myself included, I think from time to time, good to step back to be sure we're glancing at the forest and not getting hung up on the proverbial trees, as it were. And so back to the beginning, and that's Ernest Becker, who in his book, The Birth and Death of Meaning, says, I want to understand why people do what they do when they do it. And he wants to be intellectually ecumenical and ensure that we consider lots of disciplinary viewpoints while at the same time insisting on empirical corroboration of the ones that we'd like to retain. The denial of death is where Becker points out that what he believes to underlie most human behavior, whether we're aware of it or not, is the disinclination to die that results from our having the cognitive capacity to realize that we exist, which is magnificent in that it also enables us to imagine things that don't yet exist and have the audacity to transform our dreams into reality. Realizing that we're here is tremendously uplifting. I, I'm glad to wake up every day and still be alive. And yet, Becker points out that the awareness of one's existence also necessarily engenders a, a concomitant recognition of the inevitability of one's death, compounded by the realization that you can be summarily obliterated at any time for reasons you could never anticipate or control. Becker's point is you wouldn't be able to stand up in the morning if that's all you were aware of, that you are a transient piece of respiring carbon-based dust, and that in order to manage the existential terror that would otherwise result we embrace culturally constructed beliefs about reality, Becker calls them cultural worldviews, that reduce death anxiety by giving us a sense that life has meaning and that we have value. And from Becker's perspective, whether we're aware of it or not, 
what motivates us most of the time is an effort to maintain faith in our beliefs and confidence in our self-worth. And when either of those psychological dimensions, our belief or our self-worth, is threatened, the argument is that we will engage in compensatory behaviors that restore our beliefs and our feelings of self-worth. Terror management theory was our effort to frame Becker's ideas in a way that would allow us to derive hypotheses that we could then subject to empirical scrutiny. English translation, we thought Becker's ideas were great in the 1980s when we first stumbled onto them. Other folks did not agree with us. In fact, our first paper, as you know, was rejected, and the reviewer in a single sentence just said, I have no doubt that these ideas are of no interest to any psychologist alive or dead. And we were like, all right, we're experimental psychologists. Let's see if these ideas have merit by traditional scientific standards. And so for the last almost 40 years, that's what we've been doing. And we have found three basic insights. One is just that self-esteem does indeed buffer anxiety in general, and about death in particular. When we raise self-esteem, not to be confused with narcissism, people are less physiologically aroused when we threaten them with electrical shocks. More directly relevant in another paradigm, we call this the mortality salience paradigm. This is where we remind people of their own mortality. Sometimes we say, just write down your thoughts and feelings about dying. Sometimes we go outside the lab and we stop some people in front of a funeral parlor, other people 100 meters to either side. Our thought being that if you're talking in front of a funeral parlor, death is on your mind even if you don't know it. And then come to my office someday, you can read your email, and while you're doing that, we'll flash the word death for 28 milliseconds so fast that you can't see anything. And it doesn't matter how we remind people of their mortality. And it doesn't matter if you even know that death is on your mind. It influences you in profound and provocative ways. And so, for example, when we remind people they're going to die, they hate people who are different, they sit further away from them, you're more likely to vote for Donald Trump, deny that you're an animal, be uncomfortable in nature smoke more cigarettes, drink more alcohol, eat more candy, if that's what you're fond of, watch more television. In short, death reminders influence a pervasive range of attitudes and behavior. And there's now hundreds of studies, literally, that produce that effect in 25 different countries and people as young as 10 and as old as in their 90s. In other words, that's a very robust finding. And then the third paradigm is what we call death thought accessibility, and that's the flip side of mortality salience. So when we remind people that they're going to die, they become more defensive of their current beliefs. We call that worldview defense. But then we said, well, let's turn that around. If your beliefs about the world and yourself serve to reduce death anxiety, then let's challenge those beliefs. And if that's the case, then death thoughts should come rushing more readily to mind. That's a very complicated and counterintuitive way of looking at this, but it's brilliant. Yeah. I, I, well, I, I don't know if it's brilliant, though, yeah. but it is. It is. It wasn't my idea, so I'm going to declare it brilliant without any hint of narcissistic self-inflation, because basically the way that we were taught, and this is a tribute to the folks who trained us, and it's based on Nietzsche's idea, back to Nietzsche, who we like, because Nietzsche. Nietzsche said, oh, we're always saying that People are courageous when they defend their beliefs, but it doesn't take any courage to defend your belief. What really takes courage is to have the audacity to consider that you're wrong and to challenge them. So we had 
literally dozens of studies saying, okay, if we remind people that they're going to die, here's what's going to happen. But then we thought, no, we got to turn that around. If beliefs are death denying, then we need to challenge the beliefs and see if death comes to the psychological foreground. And so we developed a very simple paradigm at first, and it just had to do with asking people to fill in words like you do on crossword puzzle pages back in the old days when there were newspapers. You know, so we're like, wow, here's C-O-F-F blank blank. Your job is to turn that into a word. Coffee. Coffee. And anybody like us who's passed a Starbucks or have coffee next to us, we're more likely to say coffee. But if you passed a cemetery on your way here, even if you don't remember, you're more likely to say coffin. There's a bunch of words that that could be true for. S-K blank L-L. You passed a construction site, it might be skill. You pass a hospital, it might be skull. And we validated that measure by bringing people into the lab, subliminally exposing them to the word death or pain, and then we asked them to just fill out those word stems. So anyway, subliminal exposure to the word death, nobody saw anything and yet they fill in more death-related words. So all that establishes is that our measure works. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. All right, so having established that, other people took over. So these great researchers in Texas, they got fundamentalist Christians, and they showed them logical inconsistencies in the Bible, and then they measured what we call death-thought accessibility. Wow. And so Christians shown illogical passages in the Bible, death thoughts came more readily to mind. In other words, you're crushing their fundamental beliefs and their psychological landscape is now inundated with thoughts of death. So you didn't remind them of death. You didn't say, think about what happens when you die, any of that. You didn't interview them in front of a, a, a funeral parlor. You just show them inconsistencies in the Bible and they reacted as if you had said, exactly. think about your own death. No, nicely done. And our point, Steve, is that this is suggestive that our beliefs are psychodynamically loaded. They serve as bulwarks. Is that a word? They serve. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I can read, but I can't talk anymore. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, they serve as mechanisms that minimize death-related worries. But it's not only religion. So another group of great scholars, they showed Canadian citizens just an article of Australians mocking Canadian culture. Same thing happens. That when Canadians' worldviews are being threatened, death comes more readily to mind. We did an experiment at Skidmore and at Rutgers where we just told American students, we asked them to just think about aspects of themselves that they're not particularly proud of. We call that the undesired self. That raised death thought accessibility. We told other college students that while they're going to be very fine in their vocational lives, and don't worry, you're not going to starve, but you're unlikely to necessarily end up in the pursuit that you have chosen, that raises death thought accessibility. In other words, anything that challenges our beliefs or our self-worth... Or our defenses. Or our defenses. And my favorite one, and you guys have heard me talk about this before, is atheists. And this is in due disrespect of Christopher Hitchens, who I admire, by the way. He's dead, but what is it? God is not great. God is not great. Yeah. So in that book, Hitchens is like, look, I used to be religious, but that's before I saw things as they are. So all the rest of you poor bastards are totally deluded. But I, along with Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and maybe two other people on earth, we're not deluded. We're atheists. So we see things as they are. Well, a group in Canada they showed atheists a fake article by a supposed Harvard archaeologist suggesting that Jesus may have actually existed, and that brought death thoughts 
more readily to their mind, <laughs> uh, showing that atheism is also a death-denying worldview. It is a particularly impoverished and not always useful one. Amen to that. Yeah, although I do uh, <laughs> yeah, suggest right. <laughs> John Gray's book about atheism, where he reminds us that there's different flavors of atheism historically, and that the kind of Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens atheism is probably the most feeble and intellectually dissatisfying. But I haven't read the book yet. It's in my office. So but there's a difference time. between militant atheism yeah. that you're talking about there which you know, That's versus, right. versus passive yeah. atheism. Yeah. So we had spoken briefly about some of the issues that divide the country that we're seeing in our current culture war. And we noted, surprise, so many of them relate to death. Yeah. And we're thinking, well, maybe these engender death thought accessibility, if that's the right engender, I don't know. But, yeah, fine. You know. I think that works. So we just want to look at them one at a time. Because I don't hear anyone talking about the issues in our culture war from this perspective. And I thought we could take a couple minutes and just look at them. Let's start with abortion. Do you think this would produce death thought accessibility in some people? Sure. Now, again, my answer is going to be yes for every one of these, because the general point is that we each subscribe to a worldview where there's a lot of commonality but where there are idiosyncratic variations that depend on individual predilections. And yes, so, for example, for fundamentalist Christians in America today, abortion is a core issue now, this is complicated. I don't want to go psychobabble on you because abortion actually does involve death, and therefore it should not surprise us if intimations of mortality arise. But my point when I talk to folks about the abortion issue is to remind them that until the middle of the last century, religious people didn't care much about abortion. We all know this, right? That it was a political contrivance by a right wing conspirator in order to get the moral majority out of the gate in order to assure Republican hegemony culminating in our current circumstances. And so abortion got turned into crystallized death denial, I would submit, yes. But my short answer is yes, abortion is psychodynamically loaded. It's psychodynamically loaded in like three different ways that you could... That's you correct. Know, I mean, there's the whole heroism part where you're protecting the unborn, you're fulfilling your role in society as the defender of the young people, which is kind of baked into every everyone in every society. But if you take that to mean you're protecting the unborn, then this opportunity for heroism is denied to you by Roe v. Wade, which chills you with dread and then outrage. That whole complicated sure, part of it. fair enough. But also, you're right, it reminds you of death because it, it does involve something dying, whether it's a collection of cells or yeah. an embryo. Although I would submit, Steve, that psychodynamically, this is driven more by the heroic pursuit of symbolic immortality than it is by a genuine concern for the actual life that is sacrificed in the context of an abortion. And I, I just say that on the grounds that most people, as a demographic fact, who are opposed to abortion in the U.S. are not particularly concerned about the welfare of people once alive. That there are folks who oppose abortion that I might disagree with, but I do respect. Sure. 
They tend to oppose the death penalty. They tend to be in favor of eradicating conditions that make abortion necessary or desirable in the first place, and so on and so forth. What is appalling and suggestive that abortion is literally a crystallized instance of death denial is just the fact that the folks who are most ardently pro-life, as they describe themselves, seem cavalierly indifferent to life once it's... Some of them. Some of them. Some of them. Yeah, Yeah. some of them. One of our listeners pointed out to me that that's a generalization. Well, everything that I've said today is a generalization. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, and, And, but... This is important, yeah. but any idiosyncratic or individual deviation from the norm is not sufficient grounds for challenging the general principle. In other words, and this is something, not to go all back to Kahneman, but one of the biggest mental errors that makes the life of reason (laughs) difficult to maintain, he won a Nobel Prize for pointing out that most of us are more affected by one personal experience than by the aggregate of millions of cases. Right. Yeah. So then the most obvious one in my mind is gun ownership. We've got 400 million guns in this country. Yeah. There are some of us who bravely stand up and say, well, repeal the Second Amendment, but you know how far that's going to take you. This idea that we're going to have a mass killing every three weeks... We're still responding to the murders at Sandy Hook Elementary School, just down the road from where Ken lives, is the whole question of gun ownership. Does that, in your mind, engender death thought accessibility? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, ditto for yeah. the same reasons, right, noting right. there are actual lives at stake, but the gun is a symbol as well as a reality. And... I have no doubt, although I don't know that this has been done, but yeah, asking a Second Amendment supporter to imagine being divested of their weapons should suffice to amplify death thought accessibility off the proverbial scale. Right. And probably the best example since the history of TMT is the current pandemic. It almost goes without saying, right? Isn't this the biggest death mortality. Yeah. Well, you know, I think reminder. it's certainly pervasive and therefore we should be seeing all of these things. So for example, gun sales are through the roof as one might expect. And so are more extreme views in all of these domains that I suspect we'll be traversing momentarily. Yeah. So then white supremacy bias, it's not readily apparent that this involves dying, death, but it depends on who you are. If you're an African-American, if you're a Jew, if you're a minority, if you're a recent immigrant, then the notion of white supremacy could. But if you're a garden variety white nationalist, if you bring up the notion of white supremacy in the context of, oh, we don't approve of that, Is that a threat that would engender death thought accessibility? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, not to be overly histrionic, if that's a word, hysterical, (laughs) uh, theatrical, you know, most of the discord in our country right now, we are witnessing the death throes of white supremacy. And I say this as a demographic fact, the most significant determinant of support for former President Trump is whiteness. And it has nothing much to do with anything else. So there's a guy named Robert Pape, I think he's at the University of Chicago, and they just did an amazing study of the people who were at the insurrection at the Capitol on whatever, January 6th. And you'd think that they were mostly like on educated trailer trash, but that wasn't who was there. They were older, they were more educated, their average income was higher than the average American, and there were lots of small business owners 
what they had in common is that they overwhelmingly lived in communities where the percentage of white people was declining to the point where it would no longer be a majority for long. And this is what's happening. We talk about how we want to avoid identity politics, but we're a white nation. We're steeped in identity politics. We just don't want to admit it. In fact, the average American, if you say the word America, that activates in the neural net white. In other words, there's an implicit connection between white and America. And this is true for people of color also. And so, yes, and this is why the Trumpism is particularly virulent, because any effort to foster gender or racial equality is basically pissing on the prototype of what it means to be an American. It's to be white and to be male. Which engenders death thought accessibility, which and exposes you to dread. That's correct. And to which we respond by increasing hostility and disdain, thus putting us in the same I'm death vicious. spiral yeah. that... Wow. We've seen in other circumstances. Sheldon, what about the rising tendency to violence that's happening now? Yeah. Again, not to be silly, but that's correct. So basically, we're seeing, you know, violence spiraling out of control, even though, again, here I'm, I can't help it because I'm biased a little bit or a lot of it, rather, because a lot of the violence on the right, and let's remember that that's where most of the actual violence is, is, you know, if you like being alive, it's right-wing Christian Americans that are more likely to kill you than an Islamic terrorist, and so on. But there's violence in some of the Black Lives Matter protests some of them. It is minuscule compared to right. the other violence. And my point is, is that, again, I'm not pushing this, and nor do I insist that I'm right, but I think some of the protests that were sparked by George Floyd's death, that that was mortality salience nudging progressives to get off of the bench and to actually do something. So there can be a mortality salience-induced call to arms that I would defend as virtuous, even if it's driven by the same existential concerns that turns other people in more unfortunate directions. So then you get into wars, and obviously, let's just yeah. hop over that one. But environmental crisis, like I bring up environmental crisis to Ken, and he goes, "Well, that's something that's going to happen in fifty years. I'm not worried about it." I'm sorry, Ken. I'm no, that's no, well, no. But, I was making but, a distinction between these. And then things. I say, "Well, what about rampant wildfires? What about drought? What about hurricanes and flooding and tornadoes and all of that?" And he kind of won me back over with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, a year ago I would have been with you, Ken, and now it's like, "Yo, I hope we make it another year." So, yes, and we may talk about this, but I don't remember. I have a Skidmore student who did just a tiny little study, remind people of death, and ask them about climate issues. And it depended on one's political predilections. As you might imagine, people who voted for Hillary Clinton reminded of death. They said we need to attend to the environment and humans are responsible for a lot of the changes. Trump people said, no, it's not a problem. And they were less inclined to believe that humans had anything to do with it. So here's a situation where the same phenomenon has existential connotations, but in different directions, depending upon your worldview to begin with. Well, then the question is, if you don't remind them of their mortality, but you just bring up environment, environment crisis, does that engender death thought accessibility, which leads people to the same kind of response that the mortality salience reminder does? Yes. And, yeah. and there's some very able folks in Canada 
trying to sort out the implication of that fact for how we tailor efforts to engage people constructively in terms of these matters. Okay. So then the question, you know, the back of my head anyway, is you've got people, you ask them to reflect on abortion, gun ownership, these other death-related issues that produces a higher death thought accessibility. But then does it make sense that being reminded of their mortality by thinking of these issues would stimulate unconscious higher levels of defense of their worldview and increase their conscious opposition to someone with an opposite position? Now, now I'm talking about left and right. Yep. I think you're absolutely right. And I think this gets back to Kenneth's proposition of we have to get out of that frenetic cycle of, in Kahneman's terms, being enmeshed in that system one heuristic thought in order to rationally detach ourselves from ourselves to admit of the possibility that we as humans are also subjected to the same phenomenon that we're using to explain other people's behavior. In other words, I think that we will get caught in this inexorably perseverating cycle of escalating death denial unless we can pull out of that somehow. I say, well, the environment, that's not an emergency. And you say, oh, yes, it is. Now I'm defending a worldview. Now I've been exposed to dread. Yeah. My defense against death anxiety has been undermined. Even though we haven't talked about mortality, we haven't talked about dying. Yeah. We're just talking about environment. But now my position hardens in response, your position might harden. Yep. Yeah. Well, then we're we're talking past each other. We're not reasoning the facts or the data. That's right. We're operating on an unconscious emotional level that has nothing to do with rationality at that point. That's right. So back to Freud. The purpose of psychoanalysis is to make the unconscious conscious. And that's where the death cafes, I thought, were right-minded, producing environments that are conducive to these kinds of often difficult conversations. And I think we have talked about this before, but again, no matter, one of the things that my buddy Tom and his colleagues have done is to show that the common humanity prime eliminates defensive reactions to death reminders with regard to hostility towards those who are different. In other words, if we bring people into the experiment and we start by saying, you know, people are more alike than we are different, and we're part of one big family, which sounds like Sly and the Family Stone and corny, (laughs) but it it happens to be true. Well, When you do that, and then you remind people they're going to die, they don't hate somebody who's different because they have defined you as part of the tribe. My thought, and I'm not the only one that goes this way, is that in order to have constructive conversations between competing worldviews, they have to occur in the context of acknowledging a mutual relationship to begin with. In other words, if we could start by saying we are all American. Remember after 9-11, Le Monde, is that the French paper, said we are all Americans? Remember how for like half a day it didn't matter, you love black people? and lasted about a week. That was, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, the, flags everywhere, yeah. Yeah, well, the first guy in a turban was killed in Arizona a day <laughs> later. But all right. But anyway, for a while... We were able to literally establish an overriding identity that had something in common. I believe that to be the key, because if we start that way, then there's some grounds to not necessarily be immediately and reflexively defensive. 
I could be wrong, but I think that would be an important way to begin any kind of conversation that might end up abrasively undermining a cherished belief, is to establish that you have other ones that you hold in common. We've been talking with social psychologist Sheldon Solomon about our divided country, culture war issues, and related subjects. We're going to take a short break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We're having a conversation about our divided society and our culture war issues with social psychologist Sheldon Solomon. Sheldon, I want to talk about activism since it's everywhere now. Does activism meet an emotional need and defend against death anxiety? Absolutely. And therefore can be, I think, a ketoed into something that is genuinely heroic and uplifting individually and fosters social progress. Equally true that it could become a morbid preoccupation where your commitment to whatever it is that you're activating on behalf of is more of a fetish than it is a genuine desire to do something pro-social and beneficial or someplace in between. Is it possible that... Wait, 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 wait. (laughs) It's more of a fetish. It is. You could say I'm in favor of, I'm a green person. But it may be just identifying as being environmentally friendly, (laughs) that that is of greater overriding importance than actually doing something. So so showing up on the street and being surrounded by thousands of other like-minded people, you go, wow, this is my tribe. Look how big this tribe is. Yeah. So again, people being people, we should be willing to admit of the possibility that Anything can serve as a vehicle to enhance meaning and value. Wow. Steve and I were talking, is it possible that other concerns that are not as directly related to death could engender death thought accessibility? Just for one example, immigration. Absolutely. We already know this is true because there's been research in this domain. So we know that if you remind people of death, they become more hostile to immigrants, at least in the samples that we've looked at. I did this study with some other folks when I was at Brooklyn. We know that reminding people who live in New York or actually just asking them to think about an immigrant moving into their neighborhood increased death thought accessibility. Now, remember, this was, a well, you don't remember. This was around the time when Trump was running for president. And we did another study asking New Yorkers to imagine a mosque being built in their neighborhood, this also increased death thought accessibility. And our point is that that is how much Trump and his minions have successfully demonized and dehumanized immigrants and Muslims, that the mere thought of them being in proximity to you is enough to bring death thoughts more readily to mind. Right. And then just to close the empirical circle, in another study, we asked people to imagine a mosque being built in their neighborhood or immigrants moving into their town. And then we showed that after that, they liked Trump more, regardless of their political orientation, just wow. like they do if we remind them of death. So I hope that makes sense, that and- this establishes that anything that increases death thought accessibility has the same ultimate effects as being asked to think about dying directly. And so then if you made them aware of something that would then produce death thought accessibility, then that would kick in by making them more defensive of their worldviews, increase their conscious opposition to someone with an opposite position, not just opposition to the immigrants, but opposition to pro-immigrant people or people who are more tolerant, say. Yes. Raising the important question for future research, and Kenneth and I have talked about moving in this direction, and that is, 
Let's see if Benso's on the right track when she says that tenderness as a stance towards life is the solution to non-neurotic reactions to our mortality. And so a very important next step for us is to think about how do we operationalize tenderness, because once we can it would be fairly straightforward if we can induce tenderness momentarily, then raising these issues should not increase death thought accessibility. And humility and gratitude. And humility and gratitude. About. We yeah. already know that they yeah. work. Yeah. But of course, in Benso's account of tenderness, humility and gratitude necessarily will result from that overall stance. Okay, so here's some other examples of issues in the culture war that don't spring to mind immediately when you think about death and dying, but they're very prevalent in our public discourse. Conspiracy theories, hyper-partisanship, what being exposed to QAnon-type conspiracy theories, is that something you think would produce death thought accessibility and yep. then the response? Absolutely. Similarly, reminding people of death should increase their affection for conspiracy theories. Crazy. What about high level of inequality? That's one of our key issues, and I think it's one of the most divisive things that's ripping the place apart. Yeah, good question. I mean, it, again, in principle, yes. It's a tough question because there are many libertarians that think inequality is wonderful. Yeah, well, they have a right to be wrong. And the, the reason that I say that is that there's a huge literature that shows the devastating effects of inequality. Now, let's not be simpleton. So the World Bank has a great report on inequality where they say that the two most dangerous situations is total equality and massive inequality. Yeah, a little bit uh, of inequality is probably ne well, it's, it's because, inevitable. Uh, 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 no. Well, it's not only inevitable, it's desirable. Desirable. But, you know, this goes back to John Locke, who said that because money doesn't spoil, we are entitled to have as much of it as we would like. He even says, he uses the word hoard. He says you can hoard up as much money as you'd like without doing any harm to those around you. But that, as the World Bank points out, is factually incorrect. I don't know the Gini coefficient, but once inequality gets to a certain point, social unrest invariably results, and it is mediated by a lack of trust that inequality gets to a certain point, and people then begin to lose trust in government institutions. And we know that happiness in the United States varies as a function of inequality. It, it goes up as inequality goes down. Most importantly, perhaps, are public health outcomes. Everybody thinks that poverty is bad for you, and it indeed is, but most bad is to be poor in physical proximity to people who are obscenely wealthy. And so mortality rates are highest not in impoverished communities, but in impoverished communities surrounded by opulence. So if you wake up one day, turn on your TV, and there's Jeff Bezos flying into space with Captain Kirk, yep. and you say to yourself, what's wrong with this? It's not a conscious thing. It's an unconscious response produced by this death thought accessibility that's coming into play, you might then not think, oh, I hate Jeff Bezos. No, you think I hate myself. Yeah. So now, did we talk about this Michael Sandel guy, the tyranny of merit at any point? He's a Harvard professor. He just wrote this book, The Tyranny of Merit. And it's a great book because he talks about meritocracy and how that is superficially very good because everyone is encouraged to pursue their interests and goals, and that that's a good thing. And what Sandel says is it would be, except that we have gotten to the point where if you're not the best in whatever you do, you're a failure. And this is unique to America. And 
His point is do the math. That means that N minus one people in every social category are deficient. And what he then says is that the inevitable result is you'll be either depressed or enraged. Well, does that not describe America Doesn't, entirely? Yeah, we are yeah. either brutally demoralized or agitated to the point of rage. And his point is that this is a function of cultural values. And that, and by the way, he's no Marxist by any means. He's just suggesting that you can have a market economy in which it is not necessary to be the best at what you do in order to deem yourself a person of value. So you're sitting there watching the TV. There goes Jeff Bezos. You're sitting there saying, what's wrong with me? Like you say, you hate yourself. And then Tucker Carlson comes on or Rachel Maddow comes on and they go, oh, the Republicans, blah, blah, blah. The Democrats, blah, blah, blah. Yep. And your response is, God damn, I hate those bastards. Is that what we're talking about here? It's just an unconscious, yeah. emotional response that's got nothing to do with anything. All you're doing is watching Jeff Bezos fly into space and yep. you're now primed to hate the other team. That's right. Wow. What do we, I mean. Back to what we were is, blubbering about. But this is horrible. It's human. You know, again, uh, this is back to Nietzsche. We are all too human. And the, that's why he referred to humans as the disease called man, not a particularly optimistic uh, <laughs> way to start deliberations about the viability of humankind. But, yeah. Yeah. We've got some other ones here. We don't have to dwell on each one. Just yes or no. Yes, <laughs> because of <laughs> declining, declining, yeah. declining faith in our institutions. Well, that's an absolute. And the idea that just about every politician is corrupt. Election yeah. integrity. Absolutely. Oh, my God. The tyranny of wokeism and cancel culture. Yeah. Even though, again, and I do agree that there's, some, there's tyranny there, mm. but I feel like there's... There's also some valid points. Yeah, I, I feel... Yeah. And again, this is... We'll, we'll, uh, yeah. There's there's too much equality of seeing this as balanced on both sides. And to a degree, I agree with that. But I am sympathetic. Like one of the questions you didn't ask me was about the professor resigning because yeah, yeah, of yeah. the environment right now and the woke thing. And I see it both ways. You know, I work at a small school at Skidmore. And when the, the international students and the students of color when the power goes out in the dorm and the guy who comes to fix it pulls up in a pickup truck with a Trump hat, with a sticker, you know, having fucking machine guns and Trump won. And when they say that they feel threatened by that, they're right. I'm not saying I know what to do about it. I'm saying that for many people, myself included, we are cavalierly indifferent to the extent to which we are a white world and we're insufficiently cognizant of what impinges upon lots of denigrated minorities minute to minute. And it's just not as simple as it sounds. Having said that, I'm still in favor of free speech and Us too. in opposition to a lot of what is now passing under the guise of wokeness and cancel culture. Yeah, let's not cancel people. Yeah, yeah. But let us understand that when the white nationalists show up with their entourages on college campuses, that that is by no means benign no. to a lot of folks. We did a whole episode on free speech and we got into wokeism. And you haven't heard yeah. it because it just came up. Yeah, and cancel culture and all of that. It's a real issue in the Oh, yeah, it, and yeah. It, it's definitely yeah. a, a concern. So according to Leotard, meta-narratives or grand narratives is a theory that tries to give a totalizing, comprehensive account to various historical events, experiences, and social cultural phenomena based on the appeal to a truth or universal values. Are we losing the American meta-narrative that we all grew up with? Yes. We have no common 
historical memories. Yeah, we we don't remember Lincoln. You know, we must be friends. Remember, for most of human history, we could have vast disagreements, but still agree on our American identity. And while Trump is not solely responsible, he certainly pushed us over the edge by at no point in his presidency and to this day making any pretense of uniting us under a common narrative. In fact, basically, he's like, you either support me or you're not an American. And this will, in retrospect, historically, I believe to be the worst injustice that he has perpetrated on others of the Avogadro's number of atrocities that he has we, we engaged like, in. When you mention historical, we like to go back to Jacques Barzin, Dawn to Decadence, and Barzin saying, we hit the end of this 500-year era with the end of World War I, and since then we've been in this era of decadence, this era of decline. It's not like an immediate thing, but just a slow rolling thing. So when you think about the 1950s, the meta narrative was pretty solid, it was pretty secure. Got into the 60s and it was up for grabs. All of a sudden now we're saying, hell no, we won't go, we're not going to fight the Vietnam War. No, you're wrong about white nationalism. We're with the freedom marchers. And then, what is it? Tune in, turn on, drop out. Drop out whatever our mantra was in the 60s. But now here we are where the wheels are coming off. Now we're looking at this whole era of decadence as the, what, the beginning of a collapse. And we're looking at rising levels of violence. I mean, Kyle Rittenhouse goes and just shoots people and gets away with it incredibly. They want to give him a medal. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, Yeah, Marjorie Taylor Greene was... I've heard this phrase, I forget who said it, a cascading cultural system collapse. Would you respond to this? Do you have any feeling one way or another about Barzin and this whole idea that we're in this era of decadence? Well, again, back to Spangler, sure, sounds fine. Noting, though, again, back to Nietzsche, if I understand him, and that is that these moments of existential uncertainty can be devastating and propitious opportunities for radical transformation. And that's what I'm pinning my hopes on. All of the things, not all of the things, but a lot of what I admire about American culture happened in the aftermath of Reconstruction and in response to the Great Depression. Not to sound too glib, but I think Martin Luther King was on the right track in the letter from Birmingham jail when he says that vested interests do not relinquish power or resources willingly, and that the mere passage of time has never done anything to foster positive change. Yeah. You got to do something. You got to do something. And I like Kenneth's point, awareness comes for hope. And... I would like to think we're making good faith efforts to disseminate these ideas more broadly in the hope that some people might find them compelling enough to engage with them. So the bottom line is, you know, Henry Miller, one of my favorite authors of yesteryear, you know, he quotes Krishnamurti. He's like, everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change themselves. And so why don't we start at home for one thing? And then Miller goes on and he says, yeah, look, we all want to be Jesus or Buddha or Albert Einstein, but it is the rare person who does something life altering that is recognized in their lifetime or even afterwards for anything that they've done. But we can't know, and it is arrogant to assume that we're not doing anything. How do we know that the next Martin Luther King slash Jesus Mother Teresa 
isn't an alienated youth about to kill him or herself who hears us blubbering and is like, those guys are morons, but their jokes are good. And I think (laughs) these ideas are something to think about. Well, we may all be dead or I'll be in a jar of formaldehyde in front of the psychology department in Skidmore. And we may not know that that guy did not kill her or himself that night and then goes on to lead the world to a better moment. And so it's not for us to judge. No, No, you just got to do what you think is is going to be helpful. Yeah. You got to show up. And you got to show up. And, you know, one of the things when Kenneth and I started working together was our common affection for a pragmatic approach. And Peirce is one of our favorites. And He just says beliefs are the basis of action. And if that's not the case, then you're just schizophrenic. It's easy to have florid ideas, but we need to act on them in good faith. And back to Nietzsche, which is, yeah, it looks like the world is being reduced to a smoldering heap. But it may be that those are precisely the conditions that we need in order to foster change. In other words, back to George Floyd, the outrage that that sparked was momentarily optimistic. The white backlash has been less so, but it could be the case that this is bringing these matters to a head where they have to be confronted and resolved. And so, just like World War II, Again, back to Fromm, I'm talking to the students last week, and I'm like, okay, what are the things that Americans like the most about America? And I'm like, I'm not asking your opinion. I'm like, what do Americans like most about America? Well, they like Social Security. They like Medicare. Socialism. Well, that's my point, though. They like the interstate highway system, our national parks, the internet, all created in order to address very real needs at moments of crisis where they never could have been enacted otherwise. And so here we are in a moment of turbulence and uncertainty, and I'm not suggesting that any particular political orientation has a privileged position here. I'm just saying that this might be a good moment for the constructive changes, which will also be more likely, I would submit, not to go too far adrift, but just like we need to stop seeing like absolutes and relative as different points on a single continuum, we need to stop seeing liberal and conservative as different endpoints of the same continuum. So if you're liberal, you can't be conservative or vice versa, I get back to my students. I'm like, okay, who started the national park system in America? And they don't know, of course. And I'll be like, well, okay, that was Teddy Roosevelt. He was a Republican. And who started the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency? That was Richard Nixon. He was a Republican. We shouldn't be thinking left or right. How about if we think what's good for people and that there are some instances where a conservative viewpoint, remembering I say to the students, get a dictionary to conserve means to save. Surely that's not a terrible thought. And look at the word liberal, which you think is like gallons of pus oozing out of all your bodily orifices, but that means to be tolerant and open-minded. And so what would be wrong as Americans to step back and say, what is it about our history and traditions that are truly worthy of respect and admiration and therefore should be cherished and conserved? And what is it about what we've done that falls short of our principled aspirations And how can we, therefore, make progress in that direction? And again, this may just sound naive, but I would like to think of a progressive individual in some vaguely unspecified future as being more ecumenical 
in terms of recognizing circumstances where conservative ideas are potentially great value. Yeah. Best yeah. way forward. Folks, we've been talking with Sheldon Solomon about our divided country and a lot of related issues. Sheldon, thank you again for a terrific conversation. It's my pleasure, Ken and Steve, and thanks for having me. We hope we're going to get you back. We're never leaving you alone. I will be back. <laughs> thank you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. We've been talking with social psychologist Sheldon Solomon about our divided country and related subjects. Ken, what are your takeaways? Well, Steve, we started with the basics. Ernest Becker writes that the recognition of the inevitability of one's death, compounded by the realization that you can be obliterated at any time for reasons you could never anticipate or control, causes us to embrace culturally constructed beliefs about reality. Becker calls these cultural worldviews that reduce death anxiety by giving us a sense that life has meaning and that we have value. And from Becker's perspective, whether we're aware of it or not, what motivates us most of the time is an effort to maintain faith in our beliefs and confidence in our self-worth. When either of those psychological dimensions, either our belief or our self-worth, is threatened, we will engage in compensatory behaviors that restore our beliefs and our feelings of self-worth. Terror management theory, or TMT as it's commonly called, is an ongoing effort over almost 40 years to see if Becker's ideas have merit by traditional scientific standards. When reminded that we're going to die, we become more defensive of our current beliefs. TMT calls that worldview defense. Our beliefs about the world and ourselves serve to reduce death anxiety. When TMT researchers challenge those beliefs, they have found that death thoughts come rushing more readily to mind for their subjects, what researchers call death thought accessibility. This suggested that our beliefs are psychodynamically loaded. They serve as mechanisms that minimize death-related worries. We talked about many of our culture war issues, abortion, gun ownership, the current pandemic, white supremacy, bias the rising tendency to violence, wars, and environmental crisis. These are all death-related issues that produce higher death-thought accessibility for many Americans. Being reminded of one's mortality by thinking of these issues would stimulate unconscious, higher levels of defense of some people's worldview and increase their conscious opposition to someone with an opposing position. For example, the gun is a symbol as well as a reality. Asking a Second Amendment supporter to imagine being divested of their weapons should suffice to amplify death-thought accessibility off the proverbial scale. When we Americans consider these issues, we're not reasoning the facts or the data. That's the point that we're trying to make here. We're operating on an unconscious emotional level that has nothing to do with rationality at that point and that can push us into unfortunate directions, including violence. We discussed other culture war issues that are not so obviously linked to death, dying, or killing, but that engender death-thought accessibility. These include immigration, conspiracy theories, and hyper-partisanship, high levels of economic inequality, declining faith in our institutions, the integrity of the election, and the tyranny of wokeism and cancel culture. Anything that increases death thought accessibility has the same ultimate effect as directly asking someone to think about dying. If you made someone aware of something that would then produce death thought accessibility, then that would make them more defensive of their worldviews and increase their conscious opposition to someone with an opposite position. Sheldon notes, for example, the demonizing and dehumanizing of immigrants and Muslims results in the mere thought of them being in proximity to you as enough to bring death thoughts more readily to mind. TMT studies show that for some people, thinking about an immigrant moving into their neighborhood increased death thought accessibility. Another study asking New Yorkers to imagine a mosque being built in their neighborhood also increased death thought accessibility, 
producing not just an opposition to the immigrants, but opposition to pro-immigrant people or people who are more tolerant. Being exposed to QAnon-type conspiracy theories would produce death thought accessibility. Conversely, reminding people of death should increase their affection for conspiracy theories. Everybody thinks that poverty is bad for you, and indeed it is. But even worse is to be extremely poor in close physical proximity to people who are obscenely wealthy. Mortality rates are highest, not in impoverished communities, but in impoverished communities surrounded by opulence. The inevitable result of inequality is you'll be either depressed or enraged. Sheldon asks, does that not describe America entirely? We are either brutally demoralized or agitated to the point of rage. This is a function of cultural values. We brought up Jean-Francois Lyotard's notion of a society's meta-narrative, that we're losing the American meta-narrative. Sheldon noted that there has been little or no recent attempt to unite us under a common narrative. Sheldon says, ultimately, you got to do something. He likes our friend and colleague Kenneth Miller's point that awareness comes before hope. Sheldon would like to think that we're making good faith efforts to disseminate these ideas more broadly in the hope that some people might find them compelling enough to engage with them. He says, we can't know. And it is arrogant to assume that we're not doing anything. How do we know that the next Martin Luther King isn't an alienated youth about to kill him or herself who hears us and thinks these ideas are something to think about? It's not for us to judge. As Kenneth says, beliefs are the basis of action. I like that one. Yeah. And Sheldon notes that Freud said the purpose of psychoanalysis is to make the unconscious conscious. If researchers bring people into an experiment and they start by saying, you know what, people are more alike than they are different, and we're part of one big family, which sounds corny but happens to be true, when you do that and then you remind people they're going to die, they don't hate somebody who's different because they have defined them as part of their tribe. In order to have constructive conversations between competing worldviews, they have to occur in the context of acknowledging a mutual relationship to begin with. An important way to begin any kind of conversation that might end up abrasively undermining a cherished belief is to establish that you have other ones that you hold in common. Sheldon would like to determine if philosopher Sylvia Benso, author of The Face of Things, is on the right track when she says that tenderness, as a stance toward life, is the solution to non-neurotic reactions to our mortality. The research needed would first have to determine how to induce tenderness momentarily so that raising these issues should not increase death thought accessibility. We've discussed humility and gratitude in prior episodes. We already know that they work to deflect death anxiety. In Benso's account of tenderness, Humility and gratitude will necessarily result from that overall stance. We'll get into Benso's ideas in more detail in another episode. Sheldon believes we shouldn't be thinking left or right. How about if we think, what's good for people? What would be wrong for Americans to step back and say, what is it about our history and traditions that are truly worthy of respect and admiration, and therefore should be cherished and conserved? What is it about what we've done that falls short of our principled aspirations? And how can we therefore make progress in that direction? He says, this may sound naive, but he would like to think of a progressive individual in some vaguely unspecified future as being more ecumenical in terms of recognizing circumstances where conservative ideas are of potentially great value. This gives me a lot of hope. Me too, and these are important ideas, Steve. Important ideas as always. Folks, join us next time. Like us on Facebook. Please recommend us to your friends. Email your feedback or leave a comment on an Apple Podcasts review. Let us know what you want and how we can improve. Become a part of our community of people who value these important ideas. <laughs>
You can find us at www.thehubforimportantideas.com. And support us on Patreon at www.patreon.com front slash The Hub Important Ideas. We are 100% listener supported. And please check out our documentary video series, Conversations with Solomon, Exploring Human Motivation, on YouTube. Thank you for listening to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. Special thanks to our friend and colleague, Kenneth Miller, for his thoughtful contributions and to Goldie James for audio engineering. And pal Laura C. for her photography. Stay safe, everybody. Stay well. This has been a Contemporary Heroism Initiative production.